If somebody gives you from up high the meaning of life, it's too easy. We have to reinvent ourselves. That the meaning of life is rediscovery. So you see, physics not only unlocks the secrets of the universe, it also predicts the future. So that's what we physicists do. We invent the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Michio Kaku. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> First of all, I have a confession to make. You see, sometimes all these honors and accolades can backfire on you. Recently, New York Magazine had a contest. Who are the 100 smartest, most intelligent people in New York? Well, I'm proud to say I made the list. I'm now officially one of New York's 100 smartest people. But in all fairness, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made the same list. <laughs> and next year, they tell me that Lady Gaga is going to push me off the list entirely. <laughs> you know, I've had the privilege and the honor of interviewing over 300 of the world's top scientists who are inventing the future in their laboratories. And whenever I interview these scientists about the future, I ask them the key question, the question of all questions, the question that has haunted theologians and philosophers for generations. That question is, is there intelligent life? on the earth. <laughs> well, I was watching the Cardassians on TV last night. <laughs> and I'm now convinced, scientifically, there is no intelligent life on this planet. Nope, no chance. Well, people come up to me and they say, Professor, what does a physicist do anyway? Well, we physicists like to invent things. We invented the transistor, which makes possible the computer. We invented the laser, which makes possible the internet. We wrote the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web was written by physicists to keep track of subatomic particles. And don't forget, in your living room, we invented television. We invented microwaves, radar. We invented in a hospital the x-ray machine. We invented the MRI scan. And don't forget, we also invented the space program and the GPS satellites. And whenever we invent something, we make a prediction. When we helped to invent the World Wide Web, one physicist predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. Well, Today, we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. <laughs> but that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet could become pornography. <laughs> so, in my books, I try to summarize what these top scientists have told me. And speaking about the space program, which I write about in my latest bestseller, we have to remember that the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs did not have a space program. Sorry about that. That's why they're not here today. We do have a space program, and we're entering the second golden era of space exploration when costs keep plunging down. For example, how many people here in this room, raise your hand, how many people in this room have seen the movie The Martian, starring Matt Damon? Wow, most of you. Well, that movie cost $100 million. But the Indian government sent a probe past Mars for $70 million. 
a Hollywood movie about going to Mars costs more than actually going to Mars. So that's the changing dynamics of space travel that I'll talk about more in a moment. And in my previous bestseller, Physics of the Future, I talk about artificial intelligence, computers of the future, the internet of the future. What will the internet look like? I predict that the internet of the future will be so small, it'll be in your contact lens. You will blink and you will be online. And who were the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. <laughs> they will blink and they will be online. And your contact lens will also recognize people's faces. You'll always know who you're talking to. And if they speak to you in Chinese or Greek, no problem. Your contact lens will translate Chinese, Greek into any language you want. This is very handy. Let's say tonight you're at a cocktail party and there's some very important people at that cocktail party, but you don't know who they are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> and this could be very handy on a blind date. Let's say your blind date says that he's single, he's rich, and he's available. But your contact lens says that no, he's three times divorced, has pays child support payments, and he's dead broke. <laughs> so these could be very important in the future. In my other book, Physics of the Impossible, I talk about time travel, starships, when will we have teleportation to the stars? And I answer the question, what happens if you enter a time machine and you go back, back into the past, and you meet your mother when she was a teenager and she falls in love with you? <laughs> well, if your mother falls in love with you when you're a before you were born, you're in deep doo-doo if that happens. <laughs> and my other bestseller, The Future of the Mind. I talk about the incredible developments that we physicists have made by probing, probing into blood flow of the living brain. Did you know that we can now record memories? This is amazing. The first memories were recorded two years ago and can be sent on the internet. In other words, the future of the internet will be brain net. We'll send emotions, feelings, sensations on the internet, not just type. Teenagers will love it. Teenagers put happy faces at the end of every sentence. Why not put the emotion after the end of every sentence? And by looking at the physics of blood flow in the thinking brain, we can actually see thoughts thoughts as they're created in the living brain. And we can also show that certain old wives' tales are actually true. For example, there's an old wives' tale that says that when a man talks to a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. Absolutely true. When you brain scan a man talking to a pretty girl, blood drains from the prefrontal cortex and he starts to act mentally retarded. <laughs> Absolutely true. We can, mem we can measure this effect now rather than simply gossip about it. Now, people come up to me and they say, Professor, how did you as a child get interested in theoretical physics? Most children want to become like an astronaut or a fireman. I wanted to become a theoretical physicist. What happened? Well, what happened was, when I was eight years old, something happened which changed my life. My teachers were talking about the fact that a great scientist had just died. And I still remember they published a picture in the evening newspaper, a picture that I will never forget, a picture which changed the destiny of my life. That picture was a picture of his desk. And the caption said, this is the unfinished manuscript from the greatest scientist of our time. And I said to myself, well, why couldn't he finish it? It's a homework problem, right? 
Why didn't he ask his mother? What could be so hard that you can't finish it? Well, I went to the library, and I found out the man had a name. His name was Albert Einstein. And that picture was a picture of his unfinished unified field theory. He was looking for an equation no more than one inch long that would allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. And I said to myself, wow, that's for me. That's what I want to work on for the rest of my life to complete that book. And when I was in high school, I pursued this. When I was in high school, in fact, I built an atom smasher in my mom's garage a 2.3 million electron volt betatron particle accelerator in my mom's garage. I went to my mom one day and I said, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? And she said, sure, why not? And don't forget to take out the garbage. So I assembled 400 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and I created a six kilowatt, 2.3 million electron volt beta one particle accelerator in the garage. Finally, it was ready. I plugged it in. I heard this huge crackling sound as all the energy surged through the magnets. And then I heard this pop, pop, pop sound as I blew out all the circuit breakers in the house. <laughs> the whole house was plunged in darkness. You know, my poor mom, she come home from a hard day's work and say to herself, okay, where's the fuse box? And why couldn't I have a son who plays baseball? <laughs> Maybe if I buy him a basketball. And for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? <laughs> I mean, why does he have to build these machines? Well, then I went to college, and I learned that there was a crisis in physics. Every time we smashed a proton, we found more particles, pi mesons, leptons, neutrinos, hundreds, hundreds of particles every time we smashed a proton apart. In fact, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, made an official announcement. He said that this year, the Nobel Prize in Physics should go to the physicist who does not discover a new particle this year. <laughs> well, today, we think we can make sense out of all these particles. We think that these particles are nothing but musical notes on a tiny rubber band. Think of a rubber band. When it vibrates like this, we call it an electron. But it could also vibrate like this. We called it a neutrino. It could also vibrate like this, and it's called a quark. You vibrate it enough ways, and it gives you all the subatomic particles of the universe. So what are particles? Particles are nothing but musical notes on a tiny, tiny vibrating string. What is physics? Physics is the harmonies, the harmonies you can make on vibrating strings. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the melodies you can play on strings. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of strings. And then, what is the mind of God? The mind of God is cosmic music resonating through hyperspace. That is the mind of God. And if you want to know more about this, buy my book. But today, let us talk about humanity itself and our destiny in outer space. First of all, it all starts with this man, Robert Goddard, a man who defied convention. He built the first liquid-fueled rocket out of his own pocket. People ridiculed him. They thought he was a phony, a fake, the New York Times issued an editorial denouncing this man, calling him a total fake because, quote, rockets cannot move in a vacuum, unquote. <laughs> Wrong. This is the father of all rocketry. And why? Why did this man persist on building the first rockets when everyone was laughing at him? The reason is, when he was a child, he read a book. 
That book was War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And this young boy was hooked. He said to himself, that's what I want to become, a rocket scientist, just like what you see in War of the Worlds. And there was another gentleman by the name of Carl Sagan, the astronomer. When he was a child, he also read a book. That book was John Carter of Mars, a fiction book about a man who can somehow leap to the red planet and become a Superman. Now, more recently, there was another teenager who read a book by Isaac Asimov, the Foundation series, which I read as a child, about Earthlings becoming a multi-planet species. That man was Elon Musk, and he became a billionaire. And he's now created a fleet of rockets to fulfill the dream that he had as a child, and that is to lay the foundations for a multi-planet civilization. And why bother? Because one day we will have to leave the Earth. This is the law of physics. How will the Earth die in fire or ice? Five billion years from now, the Earth will be eaten up by the sun. On a scale of 50 million years, we have to worry about asteroid collisions. On a scale of 10,000 years, we have to worry about ice ages. On a scale of decades, we have to worry about global warming and nuclear proliferation. This is how the dinosaurs died. And whenever I see this picture, I say to myself, what was this dinosaur thinking? Looking up in the sky, seeing this huge rock five miles across come whizzing across the horizon. What was going on in that dinosaur's mind? I said to myself, the dinosaur on the left, he was probably saying to himself, this is going to really ruin my day. And the dinosaur on the right is probably saying, oh, shit. <laughs> well... That's what happened to the dinosaurs. And it was good for us, because we could then repopulate the Earth. But speaking about that, 70,000 years ago, 70,000 years ago, something happened which almost wiped out Homo sapiens. It's amazing. Every, every time I think about this, I realize that 70,000 years ago, only a handful of us, a handful of us survived this catastrophe. How many? We can calculate the number. A few hundred. Think about it for a moment. 70,000 years ago, a volcano, we think, like the volcano in Yellowstone in the United States, erupted, wiped out most of Homo sapiens, leaving only a handful, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand humans that would then populate the entire Earth. So we need a backup plan. We need plan B. We need an insurance policy to make sure that this doesn't happen to us. Now, I'm not saying that we should evacuate the Earth or abandon the Earth. No, that's too, too expensive. But we need an insurance policy. And it's getting cheaper and cheaper every year. As I said before, Elon Musk, a private individual, is building his own rocket ship to the moon and to Mars. I predict that our grandchildren will be able to honeymoon on the moon. Prices are dropping like a rock. Honeymooning on the moon. In fact, we have not one, not two, but three. Three moon rockets capable of going to the moon. NASA has the SLS. Elon Musk has the Falcon Heavy. And Jeff Bezos, richest man on Earth, founder of Amazon, has the new Armstrong rocket. This is the BFR. It may eventually take us to Mars. Already a Japanese billionaire has bought tickets, tickets to go to the moon on the BFR. This is a historic rocket. And what does BFR stand for? B stands for big. R stands for rocket. And F stands for whatever you want. Now, some people say that maybe we'll encounter alien life in outer space once we go to the moon and on to Mars. I don't know. However, I'm on radio, 
Some people call me on radio and they say, Professor, I know the aliens are out there because I've been kidnapped. I've been abducted. I've been on their flying saucers. Well, I have a word of advice. The next time you are kidnapped by a flying saucer, for God's sake, steal something. <laughs> I don't care if it's an alien chip, an alien paperweight, steal anything, because there's no law against stealing from an extraterrestrial civilization. <laughs> no law whatsoever. And just remember, then you'll have bragging rights. You'll have proof, proof of what actually happened. Now, uh, I'm going to close on the following comment, and then we're going to open it up for discussions. First of all, when I was a child, a very young kid, I had a role model. My role model was Albert Einstein. And my favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day, his chauffeur came up to him, and the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache. I will put on a wig. I will be the great Einstein, and you can put on my jacket and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. This went along famously until one day. A mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question, and Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we'll now have a discussion. And Q&A. Thank you so much, Professor Kaku. So before we let everybody else have their say, I'm lucky enough to get first dibs. So I read your book, and one of the things that I found really fascinating was your discussion of artificial intelligence. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not artificial intelligence is going to save everyone or doom us all. And I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a bit more about that. Well, I think we've been brainwashed by Hollywood into thinking that Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to come after us in a Terminator outfit and destroy humanity. Let's look at the facts. One of our most advanced robots is called Asimo. You've seen him on television. Asimo can run, walk, jump, climb upstairs, and even dance. He dances much better than me, in fact. And I had a chance uh, to interview the creator of the world's most advanced robot for BBC television. And I said to himself, compared to an animal, how smart is the world's smartest robot? He was very honest. He said his creation, Asimo, has the intelligence of a cockroach, a stupid cockroach, <laughs> a retarded stupid cockroach. So I have a really, really terrible cockroach phobia, so <laughs> this is not comforting. But as the years go by, I said to myself, eventually it'll be as smart as a mouse, then as smart as a rat, then as smart as a rabbit, smart as a cat or a dog, and then as smart as a monkey. By the end of the century, they could become dangerous. Because monkeys know they are monkeys. Robots do not know they are robots. But monkeys know they are monkeys. Now, dogs, on the other hand, dogs are confused. <laughs> dogs think that we are a dog. We're the top dog, and they're the underdog. But monkeys, they're not confused at all. I think when our robots become as smart as a monkey with self-awareness, we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. See, easy as that, right? Yeah, but that's <laughs> not for a while. Another hundred years, I think, before robots become that smart. OK, good to know. So speaking of science fiction, you're a fan, I'm a fan. And we were having a chat earlier about some things on which we disagree. Do we want to go into that? Yes, well, first of all, whenever I watch a science fiction movie, my first reaction is, I cringe. 
I calculate how many laws of physics they violated in the last 15 minutes. <laughs> but then I say to myself, now, wait a minute. This is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be fiction. You see, when I was a child, I actually had two role models. The first role model was Albert Einstein, because I went, wanted to complete what he couldn't complete, which we think we can do now with string theory. But, I, but on Saturday mornings, I used to watch Flash Gordon on television, and I was hooked. I mean, ray guns, invisibility shields, cities in the sky. <laughs> What's there not to love with Flash Gordon? So whenever I watch science fiction, I cringe. But then I say to myself, now wait a minute. Children are watching the same movie. They don't know the laws of physics, but they love science as a consequence. So I say to myself, okay, if H.G. Wells could inspire Goddard, and if Edgar Rice Burroughs of Tarzan could, it could inspire Carl Sagan, all power to them. So I think that even if I have to cringe, that's the price you pay. Look, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. But you have to admit that when you hear things like it's a sphere of pure energy, a little bit of you dies inside. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just saying that it's worth the sacrifice. Physicists dying a little bit, generations of scientists and progress for humanity. Yeah, but you know, I speak to scientists a lot and I ask them how many people in the audience as children were inspired by Star Trek? And a lot of them are NASA scientists. And a lot of them raise their hand and say that, yeah, when they were kids, Star Trek paved the way for them to become a NASA scientist. So that's the price we pay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So what meets your standard? What would you say is good science fiction then? Well, one of my favorite science fiction movies is the movie 2001. Mm -hmm. The only thing wrong was they got the date wrong. <laughs> 2001, no. 2100. 2100 will have thinking robots, will have spaceships to Jupiter. But you see, that movie was very interesting because the aliens usually have makeup on them, like on Star Trek, they have makeup on their noses, and they're just actors. But in 2001, the aliens are, well, they have robots that are self-replicating. They can make copies of themselves. And that is the most efficient way to explore the galaxy. Forget Captain Kirk. Forget the Enterprise. There are too many planets out there. You take a robot and it lands on the moon, makes copies of itself, as in the movie. Thousands of copies which then go out and make more copies, and then you have an exponential explosion of robotic probes that colonize the Milky Way galaxy in 100,000 years. Now, who else does that? Mother Nature. Mother Nature has a virus which lands on your cell, makes hundreds of copies of itself which land on other cells, makes more copies, and then in two weeks, you start to sneeze. Amazing, a molecule can cause you to sneeze in two weeks. That's the way to colonize the galaxy. Self-replicating robots. And it's all in the movie 2001. So our aim is to be a sort of cosmic cold. Yeah. Very inspiring. <laughs> well, what about you? I'm, I'm sure there's some movies that make you cringe. <laughs> I have thoughts about Interstellar, yes. <laughs> there was no way that should have been a manned mission. The planet was definitely inside the Schwarzschild radius, and love is not the strongest force in the universe. <laughs> whole rant, uh, perhaps another time. <laughs> but the black hole was absolutely beautiful. And that's actually what frustrated me because they got all the hard stuff right. And I love the circular wormhole. That was, that was amazing. But actually, that, that actually did get me thinking. And, and again, sort of thinking back to your book. One of the things I really loved, and, and this is the great thing about science fiction, I think, is that you can paint a picture of something that's far in the future and far beyond what we can do right now. And you look at something like that and you think, how could we possibly get there? Here is where we are, that's what's over there, and you can't see the connection. And when I was reading your book, I would often find you would open with an idea that, you know, sort of laser teleportation that, that made me sort of think, really? You know, I, I was with you along here, but really, are we, are we going to get there? But then you would bring it back and talk about what we actually have today, and then really take me through, logically, how we could make these incredible advances. And I thought that was really fascinating. I'd love to hear more. 
One example is that Isaac Asimov wrote about us being pure energy, rocketing through outer space at the speed of light as pure energy. And when I read that, I said to myself, that's stupid. I mean, how can we become pure energy and explore the galaxy? And then I realized it is possible because one day we will digitize the human body, digitize our memories, digitize our brain cells, and all that information will create a carbon copy of ourselves and we'll be immortal. You go to the library and instead of taking a book about Winston Churchill, you'll talk to Winston Churchill because he's been digitized. I would love to talk to Einstein. I would love to sit down and talk to him because he's been digitized. Everything known about him has been digitized. So we take this information, put it on a laser beam and shoot it to the moon. In one second, you're on the moon. No booster rockets, no accidents. In 20 minutes, you're on Mars. In six hours, you're on Pluto. In four years, you're on the nearby stars. And let me stick my neck out. I think this already exists. I think aliens in outer space, they don't deal with flying saucers. That's so 20th century. <laughs> now, they don't deal with booster rockets and meteorite impacts and accidents, weightless, all the, all the horrible things about space travel. No, they digitize themselves, shoot their consciousness at the speed of light across an intergalactic laser highway and if there's a laser highway next to us, we are too stupid to even know it. We don't even have the instruments capable of detecting a laser highway where billions of souls rocket at the speed of light throughout the galaxy. So, but you're right, we are kind of stupid. But where does that leave us with the ethics of all of this? So thinking about something like implanting memories, I mean, as you said, there are all sorts of incredibly cool applications of that, but it's also a little bit uneasy making. Yes, as I mentioned two years ago, in mice, the first memories were recorded and then played back, and the mouse remembered something that they did months earlier. Now we're doing it on primates at Emory University and also in Los Angeles. Next will be Alzheimer's patients. So an Alzheimer's patient will push a button and then memories, memories come flooding into their hippocampus and they remember who they are. Now at MIT, they even inserted the first false memory into a mouse. That raises all sorts of ethical considerations because one day you will go to the, uh, the CD store or video store and you'll get that vacation that you never had. However, it has to be clearly marked. This vacation is fake. You never went to Cancun. You never went to Hawaii. But what happens if you remove that? Then memories could become all mixed up. And the police are going to have a hard time. Eyewitness accounts of memories can't be trusted anymore. So I think we have to be very careful. It's a very powerful technology. But BrainNet is coming because we can already tape record certain memories. And some people think that one day we'll learn calculus. We'll learn calculus by pushing a button and having all that knowledge put into our mind. Just like the movie Matrix. Remember the movie The Matrix where life itself was an illusion? In fact, let me ask you guys a question. Let me ask you a question. How many of you people out there late at night, just before you go to sleep, how many people here have had that weird feeling that maybe, just maybe, life is an illusion, like in the movie The Matrix, that you're the only real person. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you ever have a feeling. I mean, now I do. Oh my God. <laughs> you guys are crazy. <laughs> I'm in a room with all these crazy people. How can you be the only one in the universe when I'm the only one in the universe? <laughs> I'm actually in New York right now, just about to go to sleep, having my memories uploaded. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> Well, so now we're all thoroughly terrified, but you still, so you're still pretty optimistic though about where we're going and how we're going to get there. How do you stay that optimistic? When I encounter people, many people are pessimistic about the future, and I tell them that's because there's a gene, a gene for pessimism, because our ancestors were pessimistic, they were cautious, because our ancestors, our ape ancestors who were not cautious, 
died because they took too many risks and those genes never spread. So I think there is a pessimism gene. But I think history is made by the optimists. As General Eisenhower once said, wars are won by optimists, never pessimists. Pessimists do not make history. But on the other hand, science, you see, there's no gene for science. We're not born with a gene for science. We are born, I think, with a gene for gossip, for jumping to conclusions, for making up stories. I think there is a gene for that. But there's no gene for science. And so I think that uh, optimism, scientific outlook, is an acquired taste, that you have to develop a, a feel for it. Now, my personal attitude is, the smallest unit of history is the decade. Anything smaller than a decade, you get random fluctuations. And when you look at history, decade by decade, then you realize the enormous progress that we've had. I mean, my grandparents lived in a world where high-speed travel was getting stuck in the mud with your wagon, and long-distance communication was yelling out the window, and life expectancy was about 45 years of age. You know what they say? Life is short, you're born, you grow up, and then you die. Life's a bitch. Well, yeah, life is a bitch. But then came science. Now we can live into our 70s and 80s. Now we have high-speed travel, we have the internet. We've opened up new worlds to mess up. <laughs> so inspiring. I like life is precarious, eat dessert first. <laughs> So you see us keeping going, and I really like the discussion of the type one civilization that's sort of on our horizon. Perhaps you could talk a bit more about that. When we physicists look in outer space, we know they're out there. There's so many stars, so many galaxies out there, but we don't talk about little green men. We like to rank things by energy. That's what we physicists do. We give numbers and rank things by energy. So a type one civilization is planetary. They control the weather. They control the atmosphere. They control atmospheric geologic phenomenon on their planet. That's called type one. Sort of like Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. Then there's type two. A type two civilization is stellar. They control the output of an entire star like Star Trek. The Federation of Planets is a typical type two civilization. Then there's type three, galactic. And these creatures roam the galactic space lanes. They play with black holes. They roam the galaxy like Star Wars. Star Wars would be a typical type three civilization. Now on this cosmic scale, what are we? Are we type one that play with the weather? Are we type two that play with the stars? Are we type three that play with the galaxy? No, we're type Zero. We don't even rate on this scale. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. However, I think we are about 100 years away from type one. Take a calculator. You can calculate that we're about 100 years away from type one. For example, what is the internet? The internet is the beginning of a planetary telephone system. It is the first major type one technology to fall into our century, the internet. And take a look at the language. What language will this type one civilization speak? On the internet already, we know that English and Mandarin Chinese are the two dominant languages on the internet. And take a look at sports, entertainment. Sports, we have the Olympics, we have soccer. Take a look at fashion, we have Gucci, Chanel. Uh, we have a planetary music being developed. It's called rock and roll and rap music. Oh, my God. <laughs> so we're talking about a planetary culture being created right before our eyes. And I think by 2100, we will become a type one civilization, a planetary civilization, unless we really mess it up. <laughs> that could also happen. So if the internet is our first type one technology, do you have any ideas about what the second might be? Um, that I don't know. Uh, however, if I, if I could not know, I would become a billionaire and I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> I'll be out there vacationing so someplace. <laughs> 
So we've got just over five minutes to go. So I thought we'd just do something really nice and easy and talk about what you think is the most exciting technology on our horizon. Maybe it isn't going to be the second technology of a type one civilization, but we're in this period of extraordinary and exciting change. So what are you looking forward to? Well, the two greatest problems in all of science is to understand the very, very big, that is the creation of the universe, and also the very, very small. Where, does, where did life come from? Where did consciousness come from? And there's so many things we don't know, like looking at the cosmos, we realize that every high school textbook is wrong. Every high school textbook says the world is mainly made out of atoms. Nope. It's made out of dark matter and dark energy. There's a Nobel Prize, a Nobel Prize waiting for the person who figures out what is dark matter, which is invisible, and dark energy, which drives the Big Bang. And if any of you, if any of you ever figure out what dark matter or dark energy is, be sure to tell me first. <laughs> we'll split the Nobel Prize money. So we're looking forward to scientific achievement, but technologically, any, I mean, one thing that sort of makes me sad, I think, honestly, and I don't know why I'm ending on a pessimistic note, is I feel like I was born 50 years too early for this second space age. And you just think about the way that space is being democratized and commercialized and the accelerating pace of change. And it does make me wish that I could live longer and see it. Speaking of hope? living longer, I think uh, immortality or a form of immortality is possible in the coming decades. Two kinds of immortality. First is genetic biological immortality of just living longer. And the second is digital immortality because already in Silicon Valley, there are companies offering to digitize everything known about you your credit card records, your uh, Instagram pictures, everything known about you digitized. And the Connectome Project will map the entire brain. Just last month, uh, scientists uh, were able to digitize the brain of a fruit fly. A fruit fly has 100,000 neurons. We've now <laughs> digitized every single one, and we know the architecture of the brain of a fruit fly. 100,000 neurons. We have 100 billion <laughs> neurons up here. And that could be digitized by the end of the century. And then we'll become immortal. We'll be able to duplicate your emotions, your feelings, everything. Then the next question is, well, is that really you? Well, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, it all depends on how you define you. <laughs> if you are a biological entity, then this immortality is like a tape recorder. But if you is a sum total of all your dreams, feelings, memories, all your desires, if your soul, if your soul can be reduced to information, then you can live forever. So one day in the library, your great, 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 great grandkids will want to talk to you, and you'll talk to your great, 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 great grandkids. Digital immortality. The other immortality is biologic immortality. And we're making enormous strides in that area as well. For example, aging. Where does a car age the most? Well, a car ages the most in the engine. That's where you have combustion and moving parts. What is the engine of a cell? The mitochondria. So we now know where aging takes place in the cell, the mitochondria. And then one day we'll digitize millions of old people, digitize millions of young people, and look where all the mistakes are, and then use genetic engineering to cure those mistakes. So I think that a form of immortality is not too far off in the distance. And would you opt to be digitized if you had the choice? Oh, would I want to have a ch chance at being immortal? Well, why not? I mean... <laughs> I guess However, the, there is a Greek myth, the, the, the tale of poor Tithonus. Once upon a time, there was a Greek goddess, Aurora, who fell in love with a mortal human being called Tithonus. She asked the god Zeus for eternal life, for the boyfriend, because she was immortal, but the boyfriend was not. So Zeus gave uh, the, the human boyfriend the gift of immortal life. But you see, Aurora made a huge mistake, a huge mistake. 
She forgot to ask for eternal youth as well as eternal life. So every year her, her boyfriend got older and older. She was immortal. She was young forever. But the poor boyfriend. So I think that when we have the secret of eternal life, we should also have the secret of eternal youth to go with it. Uh, so this has been absolutely a huge honor for me. And thank you for inspiring me uh, years ago. And it's incredible to be here now and to hear you speak. But I think I speak for everyone here when I say that that was absolutely inspiring. And I am full of hope and excitement to see what happens next. So thank you very much, Professor Kaku.